Mm-hmm. Initially, when you read about Dumas, you read about his literary successes, yeah. how prolific he was, that he went broke mm-hmm. and had to run away. And it's almost like he fizzled out. Yeah. And not that it's not true at all. Even when he ran from his creditors, he took his money with him, mm-hmm. as we mentioned. And he continued to write. He helped with the Italian Revolution. Mm-hmm. He was given the directorship of the National Museum. He had a newspaper. He wrote. He serialized historical writings about what happened in France's Le Monde newspaper. Right. And also, too, he, he, for too long, he was just sort of seen as a popular writer. That's what I mean. When you re- if you look at him, you only learn about his fictional work. Right. You don't learn about his political activism. Right. Victor and the is, historical wrote. They save that for Victor they Hugo. They save it for Victor. And it seems as though he stays away from that. He plays it safe. Right. And the more you dig, and we found these things were fans of his, but we didn't know he did this much. Yeah. And this you just pod- hear little parts of it. And this podcast could be a lot bigger. Oh my gosh, it's I mean, so this is hard just like to an narrow pit down of like what craziness. he did. And if you go to Wikipedia, if you go to different websites, they do not list all of his accomplishments. No, they don't. And they don't tie him together enough with Garibaldi. And they do not write about how important his role was in the Italian Revolution. Hello and welcome to... The Fantastically Terrible Podcast, Episode 24. Alexandre Dumas was black, y'all. Alexandre Dumas was a French author born on July 24th, 1802. He entertained people with his wit, panache, and humor. He wrote over 200 novels and is best known for his timeless classics, The Three Musketeers and Count of Monte Cristo. When you think of swashbuckling adventures, Dumas' name is at the top of the list. He was a master of complex characters and dialogue. He could plan and organize scenes to keep the action moving. And of course, his signature cliffhangers to keep readers wanting more. And more and more. Mm -hmm. And he was equally skilled at introducing readers to historical figures like Napoleon Bonaparte, Catherine de' Medici, Charles V, Marie Antoinette, and many more. With all that said, let's dive deeper into his past and his challenges, including growing up in an increasingly racist period in French history. So, what inspired him? What drove him to work so hard? Keep listening and you'll find out. Alexandre Dumas was the son of General Thomas Alex Dumas, which we spoke about in episode 14. So there might be a lot of Alexandre Dumas. <laughs> right, and so the general, we're just going to call Alex. So due to tragic circumstances, which again we mentioned in episode 14, his father, who was of equal rank to Napoleon Bonaparte during the French Revolution, died when little Alexandre was just four years old. That's right. Uh, The story goes, he was at his mother's house, whisked away by his grandparents. Young Dumas, sensing that something was up, grabbed his father's saber, rushed back to his parents' house, storms into the house where his father is lying in his bed, dead, with his mother next to him. And his mother turns and says, Alexandra, what are you doing? And he says, I'm here to go to heaven to kill God, because God killed dad. And this sets up a very powerful impression of a young Alexander of what he was to to do next in honoring his father for the rest of his life. Right. The ideals of the French Revolution, liberty, equality, and fraternity for all French citizens, regardless of color or religion, was completely abolished when Napoleon took over. He brought back racial laws and religious laws that restricted minority groups, It affected anyone of African ancestry, Jewish, and they were all restricted in their movements, where they could live, who they could marry. It was very oppressive. And that's what we said. It was a very different world than the world of his father, where all things became possible during the revolution. All Mm -hmm. of that was taken away by the time his son was just four years old. Another cruel twist of fate was Napoleon hiding 
the great feats, especially by people in the revolution who were Haitian or of African descent, mm -hmm. because it didn't jive with having colonization and slavery, which he reinstated. Right, and to the point that the general who had served with them, even though they didn't agree, uh, Alex and him, he actually withheld his pension. So That's it a, right. It was a, it was a knife big in knife back. in the back. He not only ignored and erased him from history, mm -hmm. there's even an account of Napoleon. There was a famous painting like they did for all great battles where General Alex Dumas led the troops to victory. Right. And Napoleon requested that the painter make him blonde hair and blue eyed. Right. And I'll have a reference to that link in the show notes. Which is the ultimate, this goes with a lot of the other episodes we talked about. Erasure. Yeah, whitewashing of history. Yeah. And this happened immediately. And they did not, as Miguel mentioned, they did not pay his military pension. And remember, he was a general. He wasn't just a soldier to his widow and his family. Right. So they were completely cut off. And uh, Alexandra's mother, Marie-Louise Elizabeth Laboré Dumas, had to raise Alexandra on her own. They grew up very poor, and he could not have a formal education. But she shared with him the love of reading and many stories about the great exploits of his father. You, so not only does he have this profound love for his father, yeah, as you mentioned in yeah. that story, but he idolized him. He did. And it's interesting, too, uh, that his father's friends would drop by to check up on them. So he would also get additional stories from them. There's a wonderful book called The Black Count, Napoleon's Rival and the Real Count of Monte Cristo, the General Alexandre Dumas by Tom Rees. And as we mentioned in episode 14, we highly recommend this book, both for its highly researched information. Yes, it won the Pulitzer. So It won the Pulitzer Prize, but it's also a fantastic read. Oh, it's, it's like great. an adventure story, but it's all true. <laughs> yeah. And he, this is a quote from his book. Alex Dumas was a consummate warrior and a man of great conviction and moral courage. He was renowned for his strength, his swordsmanship, his bravery, and his knack for pulling victory out of the toughest situations. He was a soldier's general, feared by his enemy and loved by his men, a hero in a world that did not use the term lightly. He was just a very principled. Something out of his son's books. That's right. So what Tom Reese does is really point for point shows that the exploits of his father is what inspired stories, especially the Count of Monte Cristo. This is also taken from Tom Reese's book. But when, by the wiles of conspiracy, he found himself imprisoned in a fortress and poisoned by unknown enemies without hope of appeal and forgotten by the world, it was no accident that his fate sounds like that of a young sailor named Edmund Dantes, or Dante, about to embark on a promising career and to marry the woman he loves, who finds himself a pawn in a plot he never imagined, locked away without witnesses or trial in the dungeon of an island fortress called the Chateau d'If. But unlike the hero of his son's novel, The Count of Monte Cristo, Alex Dumas met no benefactor in the dungeon to lead him to escape or to a hidden treasure. He never learned the reason for his trials, but his abrupt descent from glory to suffering. So in his book, Tom Reese points out that the basic plot line of Edmund Dantes had definite links to things that happened to his father. His father was imprisoned yes. in a dungeon yes. in Naples. In Naples, which is actually something, other than just living in France and being mixed myself, that we also share. Um, my family comes from Naples. So, <laughs> on your mother's side. On my mother's side. So reading that was just sort of like weird. At the end of his life, General Alex Dumas was imprisoned in Naples mm -hmm. and uh, was treated terribly. He barely yeah. survived it, and they say he was actually poisoned while he was there. Which was quite common. And the rumor was that Napoleon actually asked for him to be poisoned, but that's not verified. That's not verified, but not unusual for the time. The thing is, they liked he... poison in those days. Yeah, a and, good good old batch of arsenic. Right, and when he came back, they said he he had developed stomach cancer. Now the interesting thing, and is... and he's a strong man. Every account from mm -hmm. tall, strong man. And when he came back, he got finally was released. He they was brought weak. him back to France. And that's when he was just a shadow yeah. of, him, of himself. And we have to keep in mind, arsenic is a carcinogen. There is a possibility, of course, that the being poisoned is what led to his cancer. 
So unlike the hero Edmond Dantes in The Count of Monte Cristo, where he meets a great benefactor who leads him to a treasure and he exacts his revenge, mm -hmm. unfortunately, Alex Dumas never learned the reason for his trials, never learned about what really happened to him. He fell from glory into suffering without ever knowing what really and happened obscurity. or why. And obscurity. And obscurity. And this is the thing. When you're a person who writes fiction, such as ourselves. And you know, for me, if that would, I put myself in his shoes and I think if that was my father and I have the ability of writing and using the pen, then my imagination would run to what if. Yes, what and if is, is a big question when what you're if a writer. Is a, bit, a big question as a writer. And then you go, well, what if my father would have been able to do this? And you could see why there's so much passion in it. And just to set the scene of Alexandre Dumas' childhood, I'm going to read another quote from Tom Reese's book. The writer Dumas grew up in a very different world from that of his father, a world of rising rather than diminishing racism. His fellow novelist, Honoré de Balzac, referred to him as, quote, that Negro. After the success of The Three Musketeers and The Count of Monte Cristo, critics launched an endless, damaging public attack on Dumas, mocking his African heritage and questioning his abilities. They said things like, he was a black-skinned tropical weed in the literary soil of France. There's an interesting amnesia whitewashing when it comes to the Dumas, because the general was erased right away by Napoleon. Right. Then you have Alexandre Dumas, who many, many people do not know his father was black, was Haitian. Yeah, no. And that, and just that shows he was you... a slave from a slave mother. I will say one thing, enslaved. Yes. And I'll say uh, the reason why is because enslaved means you've been taken and put in a right, position. Right, right, And I think this is an important thing for all of us. It's a bad habit. I do it too. So when he was a child, though, the thing that, that got Dumas going was that he loved books. It was his escape. This is his escape. His imagination was the place where he would go to. And that's probably why he was so prolific. He eventually moved to Paris and worked at the office of the... Duc d'Orléans. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and on his own time, he wrote articles for newspapers and magazines. So this guy was always working. Mm -hmm. And he, of course, wanted to be a writer. But in France, even today, without a formal education, it's really difficult to get your foot in the door. Yes, very difficult. So it's amazing that he comes from poverty. Mm -hmm. In 1829, his first solo play, Christine, becomes popular and allows him to work full time as a writer. Ooh, that's a sweet feeling. Yeah. In his 1843 short novel, George, he deals with a wealthy mixed-race child who is forced from his home on an African island of Mauritius by racist landowners. As an adult, George returns to the island and helps to inspire a slave uprising while falling in love with a white woman. This novel is of particular interest to scholars because Dumas reused many of the ideas and plot devices later in The Count of Monte Cristo. It's hard to summarize Dumas because he wrote so much and his yeah. life in himself, like his father, was an adventure story. So we're just going to list a few of the top facts that we found very interesting and maybe you don't know. Yes. But you should. You really should. <laughs> On July 27th, 1824, his son, the third Alexandre Dumas, was born. In France, they call Alexandre Dumas père, mm -hmm. or senior. Mm -hmm. And this is his son, so they call him Alexandre Dumas fils, or like saying junior, yeah. or the second. Yeah, they really don't have junior, senior, so that's how they, fils, son, père, father. Exactly, exactly. And Alexandre Dumas Jr., I mm -hmm. guess, or Fils, is one of the most celebrated playwrights in the second half of the 19th century. Yes, he He's is. He's best known for his novel, Camille, which was published in 1848 and adapted into Giuseppe Verdi's famous opera, La Traviata. A lot of the, his plays dealt with the importance of the family, women against the odds. He's very much seen as a feminist of his time period. So he was very much the opposite of his dad in many ways. It's funny how they... Yeah, he definitely had the talent of his father. Yeah. But he channeled it in different themes mm -hmm. in his stories. And Alexandre Dumas père was a fantastic writer, but not a great father. No. He, he had many affairs yeah. and many illegitimate children. 
and I, unless I'm mistaken, Alexandre Dumas' fils, who became the fantastic writer, right. he acknowledged him as his son, but there are some children he never acknowledged. Yeah, and it took a while for him to acknowledge mm. his son. And what's interesting, though, is that even once he acknowledged him, and he paid for his education, he got the best education he could get, mm-hmm. something he didn't get. Right. But there was a point of contention that his son felt that his father's lifestyle and his spending was just too over the top. Yeah, one thing that overshadows all of these other accomplishments is that as much money as he made and he was very wealthy he for a time he was more popular than victor hugo Mm -hmm. and if anyone's been to france you'll notice the most popular street names are either charles de gaulle or victor hugo right any city any town any tiny speck of land will have those two streets here, Victor Hugo is God. Yes. If you, actually, I would say throughout Europe. I've met a lot of Europeans who well, were French who love Victor. Uh, yeah. Many people have read Les Mis or seen the movies. Yeah. Um, many people are familiar with Victor Hugo, but he's so high up here in France. So it just yeah. shows his popularity even at the time. Yeah. Although perhaps maybe you can argue Dumas is more popular now posthumously with well, his I think novels and it, movies. It depends on two things because Victor was very... Well, He's seen as, not just as a writer, but a polit- political figure. Yes, that's, that's true. That's a lot of people difference. don't know Victor Hugo the, after the revolution. He Just like in Les Mis and his themes, he's just more serious. Dumas was more fun. Victor yeah. Hugo really talked about the plight of the poor. And uh, he was very democratic, wanted equality. Uh, was And he was in the National Assembly here in France. Yes. Which but, got him in trouble later. But even today, scholars are looking at Dumas' work and realizing... That perhaps because of his race, even his inclinations to help, and we'll talk more about it in, as we go on in this podcast, that his inclinations were very similar too. And we'll see that with Italy. Hugo and Dumas were, I guess you can call them friendly rivals. Frenemies? Frenemies. And they had temporary quarrels followed by reconciliations. It was an up and down type relationship. Artist friendships are like that. Yeah, because they're also competitors. Right. And they were both extremely intellectual. Mm -hmm. And of course, there's a rivalry. Mm -hmm. I was reading, this is not related, but they even visited. There's a a famous hashish club that Hugo and Dumont and some other guys would go to. I'm picturing Victor Hugo and... Alex, uh, true. Uh, I oddly found that the other club. day. <laughs> but anyway, continue. <laughs> so the two, because uh, some people mentioned there are, which I don't want to go into in the show too much, but there are accusations of plagiarism uh, by Dumas. And these were raised during his time, even by Victor Hugo, Hugo not just Hugo, but lots of different people. But it was always mixed in with racism. Right. It was always their depiction of racism. How could he be a good writer? Just like it could be in many other periods in history. Oh, when you take someone like Prince, who just recently died, there were ac- some accusations towards him about plagiarism, too. And that's usually mixed in with race. As you mentioned, Hugo ha- was in politics here in France, and he mm-hmm. was really fighting for the ideals of the French Revolution. But unfortunately, things here turned again. They turn one way, they turn another. You have a revolution, then you have Emperor Napoleon. You have another president, and then you have another king. Yes, Napoleon III takes over. He was elected president first after the ousted king in 1848. And then he takes over, just like his uncle. <laughs> so Louis, uh, Napoleon the Third took over, and when he did that, Hugo was on the bad list. Right. He was part of the National Assembly that was overthrown, and he was kicked into uh, kicked out into exile. Because Hugo, kind of like Dumas, always spoke his mind. Mm-hmm. He never waffled, and if he said bad stuff about you, he meant it, and he would never take it back. So he was exiled and ended up in Brussels or in yeah, Belgium. In Brussels. And he lived there for quite a few years. While he was there, he and Dumas rekindled uh, their friendship because Dumas was in Belgium mm-hmm. escaping his creditors. <laughs> and one interesting in thing, France. though, too, is, is that even Dumas was in the outs after Louis Bonaparte III came in. He would visit and support Hugo, openly support him, because right. at this time people wanted to distance themselves from Victor Hugo so they wouldn't get in trouble by Napoleon III. But Dumas stood by his friend. Right. And I'm mentioning this because people kind of freeze things in time. Well, Hugo accused him of plagiarism in 1833. Okay, but follow the story along. By the time Dumas died, 
Victor Hugo wrote, quote, no figure in this century has exceeded the popularity of Alexandre Dumas. His, his successes were not merely successes, he made them triumphs. They had the brilliance of the brass band about them. That's fantastic. I can have a link to his letter to Alexandre Dumas' fille, the child of Alex Dumas, mm -hmm. giving him condolences and really praising his father. Right. So when people freeze one moment in history, they don't notice that Hugo and Dumas had a complex relationship that were rivals, especially when they were younger and became better friends as they were older. So I just wanted to bring that up to take away from some of the detractions. There was a movie that Roman Polanski made. Right, which he, on... he had Gerard Depardieu play a black man. But anyway. Yeah, there's problems with that. But it, there's this idea that he didn't write his stuff that keeps being brought up once in a while on the fringe. But you have to look at the you have to look at the consensus is not a conspiracy theory. But I think just like the detractors back in the day, mm -hmm. it's tainted in racism. I think so. You know, it's 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 something that unfortunately we people of color always face, never being legitimate, no matter what we do, no matter how much education we get, no matter what our achievements are. If I play devil's advocate, he wrote so many things, and he wrote a lot of travel books, cookbooks, historical fiction. He wrote books where he had many assistants. I think I read he had 73 assistants who would right. help him research. But they were mostly research assistants. And research takes a long time. Oh, yeah. You need your research and your facts before you can start writing. He did have a writing partner that he acknowledged mm -hmm. named... Auguste uh, Maquette. And he uh, helped him on, I think... How many novels? 18. 18. 18 out of the 200. And some people, including Polanski, try to say that he was the genius behind uh, The Count of Monte Cristo or The Three Musketeers. I just said Cristo. <laughs> behind uh, some of his novels. But if you see the ties to his earlier life and his earlier works, actual people who study his progression in his writing see the links to previous works. Well, I'll add some... And no one takes away from the fact that it was Dumas' genius and writing ability that made those stories. As much as the Napoleonic laws affected black people, mm -hmm. they also affected Jewish people. Now, I know Polanski is of Jewish heritage. When he did, and he did it pretty respectfully, the whole Dreyfus affair, he took on the, the, the anti-Semitism. But when he did Dumas, he had a white man play mm -hmm. Dumas. Mm -hmm. So already he's already tainted it with race. Right, right. Where he is unable... Don't pretend to be factual when you're so glaringly... Right. So if you're able to afford your own people, yeah. the complexity of what's going on to them, mm -hmm. afford us, our people, mm -hmm. the ability that... No, he he was called the Negro. I mean, you see some of the, the cartoons, they were disgusting. Yeah, yeah, I'll have links to some of those. So it's this idea, and, and it, it comes down to even if you're not of that particular group, try to put yourself and sort of see, wow, this is probably all the dynamics. If not, you're biased. And when it came to that, and I know he got really upset when he was pointed out that you got Gerard Depardieu to play Dumas. Yeah, he was offended. He, that's when he came out openly and just said, no, he didn't even write it. And, and, right, right. And that, that's, that just so shows... So if you bigotry. hear that, just ignore it. It's hate, yeah. it's being hated. It's... It, hey, <laughs> I hated I, Alexandre Dumas, we'll just continue a little bit. He died December 5th, 1870, having written over 600 pieces from plays to cookbooks to travel books. He wrote volumes of history, yes, which we'll had. talk about in a moment yeah. in Italy, and over 200 novels. Yeah. Not to detract from... Auguste Maquette. But he wrote 200 novels. We see many of them have traces to his past, right. as Tom Reese has now pointed out. Yeah very meticulously finding source material. And Auguste Maquette mm -hmm. helped him on about 18 novels. It was 18. Much later on, better late than never. In a better late than never moment. <laughs> the president of France, Jacques Chirac, in 2002, had a ceremony that filled with the utmost pomp and circumstance, exhumed the body of Alexandre Dumas and place it in the Pantheon of Paris. So the Pantheon is where all the great... The great greats of French history and literature are entombed. Yes. It's like a giant mausoleum. Giant. So yeah. this was a great honor, and as we said, long overdue. Mm -hmm. He now shares his final resting place with France's most distinguished citizens, such as Voltaire, Rousseau, Hugo, Emile Zola, Marie Curie. Yes. 
Uh, and that's exactly where he should be. Monsieur Bick, the man who carried ah, the pen. Ah, yes, the big yes. pen, if no one knew. <laughs> yeah, but I just remembered that. Uh. As we mentioned before, even Jacques Chirac, the president of France at the time, pointed out that it was due to racial discrimination that sidelined Dumas and did not allow him to be seen as a great writer. And he hoped that putting him in the Pantheon was alleviating some of the wrongs in history. Right. Mm -hmm. I'll have a link so you can watch some of the ceremony from 2002 when they brought him to the Pantheon. And one other thing, too. That year was one year solid of Alexander Dumas. Movies, plays, everything was being played mm -hmm. of his stuff in France. And people, so it was a big celebration. It was a huge celebration and good for Jacques Chirac for doing that. I'm going to again take a, a little part of Tom Reese's book and quote here. Newspaper artists in the 1850s depicted the novelist with a succession of racist cliches mocking his literary efforts. And I'll have some links to photos for anyone listening on our website. The novelist tried to make light of the racial insults, but they must have stung. The greatest sin of all, however, was that his father, General Alex Dumas, was forgotten. The son never managed to discover the full truth about his father, but he avenged him in another way, creating fictional worlds where no wrongdoer goes unpunished. And the good people are watched over and protected by fearless, almost superhuman forces. Heroes, that is, a lot like Alex Dumas. Once a man insulted his African ancestry, and Dumas, in his usual wit and flair, said, My father was a mulatto, my grandfather was a negro, and my great-grandfather was a monkey. You see, sir, my family starts where yours ends. But um boom Yes. Yeah. Now, you have to keep in mind that during his time period, not only did you have all the stuff that had happened in the past with and slavery was still... And colonization. And colonization mm -hmm. still going on. And you also had eugenics and social Darwinism. So there was this idea that black people were just a different species. So by him referring to the whole, you know, monkey bit... It, it's, it it's makes more context in, the, yeah. in that time period. Right. He's not insulting himself. He's insulting the idiot he's speaking to. Right. It's a, they, they took that whole Charles, Charles Darwin thing. They turned it into a, a, a disgusting perversion of what Charles Darwin was saying. And for anyone interested, our episode 12, Whitewash Part 1, From the Trojan War to King Arthur, and Whitewash Part 2, The Dark Side of the Enlightenment. You know, right now I'm reading a book called The Condemnation of Blackness, Race, Crime, and the Making of Modern Urban America uh, by Khalil Gibran Muhammad. And you see how all the eugenist stuff, eugenic type stuff that was crawling out of the plantations starts to make its way into the social sciences and science even more so. They in, took in the fake math and statistics mm -hmm. and turned it into a fake science. Yes. So in, in that context... This is the type of racism that Dumas was dealing with. It was at the core of scientific racism. With that in mind, you understand that the world that Dumas is living in, it's... It's being constructed. It's being constructed into the scientific racism of the late 1800s and eventual... And the, the early 1900s, 1900s absolutely. Early 1900s, yeah. And giving them a fake intellectual reason for treating people... Absolutely. Horribly. It reminds me of that famous Mark Twain quote, there are lies, damn lies, and statistics. Let's talk about Dumas' time in Italy from 1860 to 1864. Naples, as we mentioned, is the city where his father, the general, was imprisoned and poisoned. That also happens to be the city he spends those four years in. And at this time, Dumas becomes a good friend with Giuseppe Garibaldi, the man that unifies Italy. And he just doesn't just become good friends. He helps secure funds and weapons for his fight to overthrow the Bourbon dynasty. So to all our Italian and Italian heritage friends, you should also know Dumas and his part in unifying Italy and getting rid of the Bourbon Empire in creating modern Italy. Yep. So let's not forget that. Mm-hmm. Garibaldi is an Italian hero, but he's also an international figurehead for national independence and republican ideals. Uh, he's showered with admiration for many intellectuals and political figures, including Abraham Lincoln, Victor Hugo, Charles Dickens, 
Che Guevara, and of course, Alexander Dumas. In 1830, Dumas helps to overthrow the Bourbon dynasty. Did he help? Yeah, he was fighting on the streets. All right. I mean, this guy, there's so many things that one podcast can't So the Bourbon justice. dynasty was all over Europe. Remember, right. all of these royal people are always related. They're all cousins. It's mm-hmm. all one big family that takes over. Crime family. In 1830, Charles X was overthrown in France. In Italy, Garibaldi was trying to overthrow the Bourbon side, and he needed help. He needed help. We found a fantastic website mm-hmm. called... Naples, Life, Death, and Miracles. And there's a post we found particularly fun to read by Jeff Matthews. Yes. And we're going to read from that because he did such a good job writing this part. We're going to take it right from his uh, web post. We're going to read it to you. Dumas' dislike for Bourbon monarchies, whether French or the Neapolitan version, of whom he blamed for his father's death, crops up much later in 1860. By this time, Dumas was outrageously famous and decided to put his outrageous fame at the disposal of Mr. Swashbuckle himself, Giuseppe Garibaldi, a character whom Dumas would have been forced to invent for one of his many adventure novels had he, Dumas, not already met him, Garibaldi, and found out that such persons really do exist. So I guess you have two swashbucklers. You have Garibaldi and his father, General Alex Dumas. All right. Dumas gathered up one of his many young lady friends, mm-hmm. and sailed his yacht, the Emma, down to Sicily to join Garibaldi's famous 1,000 on their way to oust the Bourbons of Naples and to unite Italy. By then, Dumas was 58 years old and outgirthed. Meaning overweight. Yes. Even the heftiest swashbuckle in the armory. <laughs> <laughs> but he and Garibaldi hit it off. So Dumas sailed back to Marseille to pick up, and this is Marseille's in France, to pick up weapons for Garibaldi. He became a gun runner for the invasion. That invasion was successful. From the very beginnings when he was four, as we talked about, you know, when he said, I'm going to go kill God because God killed dad. Mm-hmm. As soon as he found out who did it, he, you know, it's 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 like right out of he one left. of his novels. It's That's like Monte right. Cristo. That's right. It is. <laughs> and because of this, uh, Garibaldi and Dumas were great friends, and he awarded Dumas the cultural director of antiquities, including the directorship of the National Museum. And it's crazy to think that one man helped revolutions in France, in Italy, but when they say he was running from his creditors, he wasn't broke. He took money with him. <laughs> I mean, as this mentioned, when he, he had his own yacht that he used to smuggle weapons into Italy to help them. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> he was living large. He was, he was living large. Now, there's another, yet another connection other than my, my, my mom's family coming from Naples. And connection I probably don't like. But my great-great-grandfather on my mom's side was a royal guard to Queen Christina the Bourbon who ended Maria up Maria Christina. Spain. Maria Christina. So there's a connection. I always feel there's always this connection. But wasn't she part of the Bourbon family? Yes. All right. So and he I helped feel like telling her. this story, I'm kind of writing a wrong. <laughs> <laughs> so while Dumas was in Italy, in Naples, he also started a newspaper called L'Independente. Uh, historians and literary intellectuals are starting to look at the much overlooked work and writings that Dumas did in Italy. Right. Because he did have, from 1841 to 44, a he serialized a 500-page book about Naples called Le Coricolo, mm-hmm. which explains what happened. We have to understand that he, oftentimes Dumas is seen as just swashbuckling, not political. But the time period now in Naples is starting to show a different light, that he was political. It took a little digging for us. Mm-hmm. Initially, when you read about Dumas, you read about his literary successes, yeah. how prolific he was, that he went broke mm-hmm. and had to run away. And it's almost like he fizzled out. Yeah. And not that it's not true at all. Even when he ran from his creditors, he took his money with him, mm-hmm. as we mentioned. And he continued to write. He helped with the Italian Revolution. Mm -hmm. He was given the directorship of the National Museum. He had a newspaper. He wrote. He serialized 
historical writings about what happened in France's Le Monde newspaper. Right. And also, too, he, he for too long, he was just sort of seen as a popular writer. That's what I mean. When you re If you look at him, you only learn about his fictional work. Right. You don't learn about his political activism. Right. Victor and the is... historical wrote, they save that for Victor they Hugo. They save it for Victor. And it seems as though he stays away from that. He plays it safe. Right. And the more you dig, and we found these things, or fans of his, but we didn't know he did this much. Yeah. And this you just hear little parts of it. And this podcast could be a lot bigger. Oh my gosh, it's I mean, so just hard like to narrow down like what craziness. he did. And if you go to Wikipedia, if you go to different websites, they do not list all of his accomplishments. No, they don't. And they don't tie him together enough with Garibaldi. And they do not write about how important his role was in the Italian Revolution. Yeah, and in, in unifying Italy. And this is, you know, as much as I love the Black Count, this... About Garibaldi, the black count I had was the, about his father. About his father, but when he says he got the ultimate revenge, to me, how do you leave out that this last part on the ultimate revenge? Because well, it, you're arguing over epilogues. Yeah, but I think that's an important epilogue, and I think that epilogue then gives you okay, he got his revenge in many different layers. Right, he didn't just write about his father and gave him the revenge he never got in real life. Right. But he went to Italy and over helped overthrow the Bourbons right. who were responsible for the death of his father. Right, which boom, I think Boom boom. Yeah, it's like Count of Monte Cristo. <laughs> I mean, that's that's amazing. And for any Alexander Dumas fan out there, I recommend the book Club Dumas by Arturo Perez Reverte. There is it's Fantastic. I loved it so it's much. Sort of historical fiction, but it goes way off in different directions. It's a detective film noir. Hmm. Club Dumas is a fun read, and you learn a lot more about Dumas. As we mentioned, there's a lot to say about Alexandre Dumas' life. Yes. We try to highlight the most swashbuckling elements. <laughs> yeah, which is tough. <laughs> which is really tough. So we'll try to segue away from all his fantastical life his and go back life. to his literary career. Mm -hmm. He also wrote horror stories like 1001 Ghosts, which was published in 1848. The Pale Lady in 1849. Le Vampire in 1851. Just to put this in context, Bram Stoker's Dracula was published in 1897. Right. And all of those, like almost everything Dumas wrote, was extremely popular. Yes, actually, his vampire, Gorgoska, was really popular for a long time, until Dracula came along and, and dethroned him. No, he also wrote about many infamous criminals mm -hmm. in a series called Celebrated Crimes. Dumas is even part of our yearly Christmas celebrations. He wrote The Nutcracker of Nuremberg in 1844. Why is that important to us now? The original version is by E.T.A. Hoffman. However, the original version was very dark. Mm -hmm. What Dumas did was make made it light and fantasy and made it a family story. Right. And it's his version that was adapted into the ballet mm -hmm. and music, of course, scored by Tchaikovsky. So when you watch The Nutcracker... That's Dumas' version of the story. Right. And you can find his story called The Nutcracker of Nuremberg. And the ballet is an interpretation in dance. Right. And many people say that you have to read the actual story in order for the ballet to actually completely make sense. Right. And it also helps the ballet to come alive. That's wild. He goes from horror stories to like... The one thing that all little boys are, don't want to see, which is like the Nutcracker Ballet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. How do you go from horror to crime crime series and then yeah. to something as lighthearted as the Nutcracker? That's insane. <laughs> He's so adept at different genres. Right. It's amazing. He loved his imagination. That's it, exactly. Mm -hmm. So one small fact that we'll also highlight that just shows how many things this man did in the late 1850s, he spent two years in Russia and wrote travel impressions in Russia. And in the book, he has a splendid tribute to Pushkin. Who is Alexander Pushkin? Well, he is considered by many to be the greatest Russian poet and the founder of the modern Russian literature. And language. And, and language. And he was also of African descent. That's right. 
although the Russians don't hide that. No, they don't. They do not. They they have no problems with their greatest their poet. Yeah, their Shakespeare. They acknowledge and never hid that he's from African heritage. Right. And we're going to save that for an ep- other episode. Yeah, I think Alexander Pushkin deserves his own show. He definitely does. The Fantastically Terrible Character or Creature this week is actually a book. We normally highlight obscure stories or characters, but today... We're going to mention an often overlooked book. It's called 20 Years After by none other than Alexandre Dumas, and it's the sequel to The Three Musketeers. It's kind of like the 17th century equivalent of the Blues Brothers. Dumas brings back his beloved characters, Athos, Porthos, Aramis, and D'Artagnan, 20 years after they triumphed over Cardinal Richelieu and Milady. D'Artagnan has completely lost touch with his friends and must find them to help him in his quest. I guess you could say he's on a mission from God. As the Jake Blues in the scenario, he seeks out the other three musketeers. Now middle-aged, they reunite for a new get-the-band-back-together adventure. It's set against the backdrop of a civil war in France, Oliver Cromwell in England threatening to send Charles I to the scaffold, and oddly familiar villain, the son of Milady. Our heroes may be older and weathered, but their wisdom and experience are fully developed. Once you've read it, and it's a huge novel, you'll finally feel like you can say goodbye to old friends. That's it for today. Seven Robots Fantastically Terrible. Podcast is by Miguel Guerra and Susie Diaz. Our theme song is by Susie. We want to thank everyone for listening. So many people tell us they enjoy our show, and it makes us feel great. So if you haven't subscribed or followed us, please do. It really helps us a lot, and we can see what works and what we need to improve. If you go that extra mile and leave a comment, we'll be able to see your name and personally thank you live on the show. For more information on the episode, including links to everything we've referenced, please visit our website at www. Dot sevenrobots.com slash podcast. Remember to check out Ghost Metal, our free webcomic on Webtoon and now on Tapas. Read each week as we serve you sci fi and horror stories on a macabre menu of detestable delights. Then we'll reach into the dark parts of our collective unconscious for dessert. A new episode is up every Friday. For your abhorrent amusement. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time. <laughs>